Yes, sir, she's gone at last. It was only five minutes ago. We heard her sigh from her corner. She sat in the kitchen, you know. We were all just busy on breakfast, John cleaning the boots, and I had just gone into the larder. But you could have heard that sigh right up in the garret, sir, for it seemed to pass one by like a puff of wind. Maybe it was her soul. Who knows? And we all looked up and ran to her just in time to see her head was sinking down on her bosom. And she's gone at last, I said. So Mrs Pouncby meeting on the stairs, her second floor lodger, me, bound citywards, told of her sister's death, doing her best to match her face's colour with the news. While I, in listening, made a running gloss beneath her speech of all she left unsaid, as... In the kitchen, rather in the way, poor thing, busy on breakfast. Awkward time, indeed, for one must live and lodge his meals, you know, must be attended to what comes, or goes, I added for her. Yes, indeed. She's gone at last, I said, and better perhaps, what had life for her but suffering? And then we're only poor, sir, John and I and she, indeed, was somewhat of a strain. Oh, yes, it's for the best, for all of us. And still beneath all else, methought, I read, what would the lodgers think, having the dead within the house? How inconvenient! What did the lodgers think? Well, I replied, in grief's set phrase, but the first floor, I fancy, frowned at first, as though indeed landlady sisters had no right to die and taint the air for nervous lodger folk, then smoothed his brow out into decency, and said, Oh, sad, and presently inquired the day of burial, ending with the hope his lunch would not be late like yesterday. The maiden lady, living near the roof, quoted Isaiah, maybe, or perhaps Job, how the Lord gives, and likewise takes away, and how exceeding blessed is the Lord, for she has pious features, while downstairs two medicals, both decent lads enough, hearkened the story out like gentlemen, and said the right thing, almost looked it too, though all the while within them laughed a sea of student mirth, which for full half an hour they stifled well, but then could hold no more, as soon their mad piano testified, while, in the kitchen, dinner was toward, with hiss and bubble from the cooking stove, and now a laugh from John ran up the stairs, and a voice called aloud, of boiling pans. So soon, reflected I, the waters of life close o'er the sunken head, reflected I, not that in truth I was more pitiful to the poor dead than those about me were. Nay, but a trick of thinking much on life and death, either peace, giveth each little strand more deep significance. Love for the whole must make us tender for the parts, methinks, as in some souls the equal law holds true. Sorrow for one makes sorrow for the world. A fallen leaf, or a dead flower indeed, has made me just as sad, or some poor bee dead in the early summer. What's the odds? Death was at forty-eight, and yet what sign? Who seemed to know? Who could have known that called? Or not a blind was lower than its wont. The lodgers would not like them down, you know. And in all rooms, save one, the boisterous life blazed like the fires within the several grates, save one where lay the poor dead silent thing, a closet chill as who hath sat at night with love beside the ingle knows the ashes in the morning. Death was at forty-eight, yet life and love and sunlight were there too. I ate and slept, and morning came at length and brought my lady's letter to my bed, thrice read and thirty kisses, came a thought as the sweet morning laughed about the room of the poor face downstairs, the sunshine there playing about it 
like a wakeful child whose weary mother sleepeth in the dawn, pressing soft fingers round about the eyes to make them open, then with laughing shout making a gamble all her body's length. Ah me, poor eyes that never open more, and mine as blithe to meet the morning's glance as thirsty lips to close on thirsty lips. Poor limbs no sun could ever warm again, and mine so eager for the coming day, 